Good afternoon, I'm Nikki Kemp and I'm Editorial Director at Creative Brief. And today in the latest of our Creative Brief Explores series, we're gonna talk about how brands and agencies are navigating the current crisis to create effective work that connects with consumers where they are today. In the midst of lockdown, with schools closed and people and parents running out of ideas and sanity, the Oreo and Digitas team pivoted their marketing strategy to focus on bringing some much needed light relief to lockdown through the Oreo playbook. The socially led campaign featured 15 fun activities which were promoted with the hashtag stay home, stay playful. The campaign was turned around in record speed through a close collaboration through the brand and agency. Um, to find out more about this playful pivot, we we're lucky enough today to be joined by Aisling Campbell, Senior Brand Manager at Mondelez, and James Watley, Strategy Partner at Digitas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here. So Aisling, um, to kick off, can you tell us a bit about the Oreo Playbook campaign? Um, we all know the data about how important it is as a brand not to go dark in a crisis or in a downturn. But could you tell us why you decided to launch this campaign um, in the midst of lockdown? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I mean, first of all, to start by saying I was brand new into the team and to the brand. I'd only started working on it in lockdown, so from March. And as I joined and was meeting the team and kind of hearing about all the plans, we were already halfway through planning another campaign that had been in development and in the works for kind of months and months before COVID and before I was part of the team. So I think us coming in and, and the world changing so drastically as it did, we all had to sort of really stop and take a look at ourselves and think, is this still the right thing for us to be doing? Is it relevant? And are people going to engage with it in the same way? And I think it took a lot of sort of bravery to say we need to down tools on the idea that we all loved at the time. Um, and pivot to something that felt more relevant and in keeping with how drastically people's lives had changed. So yeah, it was important for us to feel like it was really in keeping and relevant with the moment. It's always tough that decision to sort of pull something you put so much time and, and love and, and effort in. And, and James, I know unprecedented, I hate saying it because we've just said it so many times um, throughout the kind of lockdown period, but it's actually sort of for once, it's not an exaggeration. Like we, we have sort of collectively been in this really unprecedented time. I mean, can you tell us how quickly you pivoted this campaign to the stay home, um, you know, the stay home, stay, stay safe government messaging came out and then very quickly the stay home, stay playful? Because I think it's really easy even now to kind of forget the anxiety and the fears that everyone was facing, you know, perverse professionally and personally at that time so how did you take that strategy and shift it so quickly and have the confidence to do that um <clears throat> it's a great question um because at the time you don't really go you know you, you you're only living in the moment that you're in right so there's kind of like right i need to adopt this pandemic strategy that i've got in the bottom drawer <laughs> no you don't have that um but to to perhaps build on ashlyn's point we had a um, a campaign that we'd been briefed on at the end of January, ready to go in the oven, presented like final stage um, approvals for going into production and lockdown happened. And for us, you know, we, we had basically briefed in January for a campaign to go live in May is the timeline that we're working to. And March 23rd, that fateful day, when we were told to stay home, stay safe. Um, and we had a presentation on the 24th where we were going, right, we need to look at what we've got, what's gonna be feasible in the production timelines that we've got, what's gonna be feasible in the production limitations that we've now been put upon us. Um, we shared the issues that we had. And I remember I had to do an, a retrospective for the agency. And I remember looking at my diary and going, wow, there are literally three days from March 23rd to March 26th where we pivoted. Um, and it was, it's, I, I just get, <laughs> I get the shake thinking about it now. Um, but the, on the 24th, and, and I've got it written down, so I keep looking at my notes. On the 24th, we had our European wide um, conversation about, right, this is where we are. What do we do? Fortunately, um, my team are amazing 
Um, the, the Oreo team that work at Digitas are really, really tight. And there's a, an immense amount of trust and faith in each other. And of course, we all have all been reading the papers. And so we had some work in the back pocket just in case, right? Um, not complete, not ready, not ready for sharing. Um, you know, the, the agency term is probably embryonic um, and nowhere near at all whatsoever ready for client presentation. It was not a client ready deck. Um, and on the 25th, we said we had basically had a, a come to Jesus moment when it was just a, the um, Ashlyn, us, and bear in mind, you know, Ashlyn and I still haven't met physically in person. We, this is the only this is the only way I know Ashley on my screen in front of me. I, I'm hoping she is a real person. Um, and we basically on the 25th said we might have something else. And Ashley basically called called our called our bluff and said, "Well, show us. We don't have any time. Show us what you've got." And we're like, "Okay, we we kind of have to." And we went through it, and there was something in there that had work in it, which was the playbook. And literally the following day that we had another meeting <clears throat> and Ashlyn approved it. And then I remember <laughs> the end of that meeting, bear in mind three days ago, we had a completely different idea. The end of that meeting, the question was, right, how soon can you go live? <laughs> That's Back quite... in the whip. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a leap of faith as well, isn't it? When you're so used to um, things being very polished and very perfect to sort of, show things um, in the, the non-perfect state. But I suppose in, in so many ways, um, done is better than perfect in this, in this scenario. I mean, how was that for, as, a, as a partnership, especially because you, you guys haven't met in real life, do you feel like that element of vulnerability and that element of having to show things you know, on the fly made it very much a sort of strong partnership from the off? Yeah, definitely. I mean, what a way to start by having to react so quickly and change plans and, and hold hands and take a bit of a leap of faith, like you say, because it was into the unknown. We didn't know how long lockdown was going to last for and the impact that it would have on everybody. So it was very much, does this feel right? And are we all confident with the route that we're going in? And yes, we might not have all the answers, but let's just figure it out together and let's move quick on it as well. So I think, yeah, what an amazing way to start. And I think, you know, the guys being so open and showing that work before it was completely fleshed out and fully finished. I, I love working like that. And I'd much rather us kind of evolve it together and be brought in early. So, yeah, I mean, it's been a great, a great start to working with the team. I'm looking forward to meeting. <laughs> At some point. <laughs> some point eventually. Yeah, but you have met though, because we talk so much about chemistry, don't we? Chemistry meetings. And, and I think it is possible to kind of, create that energy in a virtual space as well, which is really interesting. And with that um, in mind, I'd love to talk a bit about the strategy for the campaign because this is a very social first campaign. And we've seen huge, I mean, meteoric rises in the amount of time people are spending on social networks and new behaviors on social networks. And I was just wondering, um, could you share a bit here about the strategy and the impact lockdown has had on this because social media is obviously like a really vibrant marketing channel influencers and and that side of marketing has long been growing but this seems to have really sped that up and mm. can you share a bit about the social side of the strategy yeah happy to so i think the first thing is that oreo is a very digitally kind of centric brand it's where our consumers are and it's where historically we've kind of had really strong results on previous campaigns so it's always where we would you know, put most of our spend in a campaign kind of overall plan. Um, so that was the sort of, you know, having your traditional marketing hat on of the answer. But then the reality was people aren't leaving their homes and all of a sudden digital consumption and social media consumption was through the roof. And I'm sure every agency in the country was tracking it as closely as we all were. So all of a sudden anything kind of outside of the home was dead. It was all, you know, digital or VOD or TV again. And that had to really shift our thinking. And I think it felt like a really natural fit for the campaign idea because we were coming from a place of genuinely just wanting to help and provide some inspiration to people who were stuck in and bored and going a bit crazy. And to kind of immerse yourself and insert yourself into that conversation, social media felt like the right channel to do that without it coming across too forced or too sort of pushing a one-way message. 
we wanted to engage people. We wanted to see what people were doing in their homes and we wanted to get a kind of two way reaction from it. So it definitely just felt like a really natural fit. It was quite quick for us to turn on as well. Great. And, and with the consumer behaviors, like we saw quite a lot of shifts in consumer behaviors as well, sort of outside of kind of media consumption habits, you know, that, that great sourdough that I never baked, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> all those different um, trends happening and people doing a lot more inside of their own homes and, and being creative. Um, and so what was the strategy there? Because obviously um, in the interest of journalistic research, I did make the Oreo brownies. I also, as part of my lockdown fitness routine, I ate them in my gym kit. And, uh, <laughs> they, were, they were really good and easy to make, which is what I need. <laughs> Great, good, glad to hear it. <laughs> How did you, because you were, you were kind of pivoting so quickly, like how did you get that consumer insight right? Because it was such, it's such a sensitive time, isn't it, as well, to get that balance between inspiring people and making people feel like you're putting another thing on their to-do list, you know what I mean? So, and I think, yeah, not shaming people as well, because some of the ideas that came out were sort of so extreme and you think, like, I've not got access to all these materials and things. So we put a very practical lens on it, first of all, like what are people actually going to want to do? Um, sorry, James, you go. No, you're fine. Um, <laughs> the, I was just going to say, the, we do, now I've lost my point. Um, at the beginning of the briefing process, we did a lot of research on what our audience were doing anyway. Um, we, the, the creative platform, um, the, the main creative route for the year was centred around a piece of creative called Busy. Um, you know, getting people to stop being so busy, put their devices down and play with each other, reconnect in family moments. And we'd, we'd done a lot of research around that. So looking at things that people were doing when they weren't busy helped infuse a lot of that stuff. Um, so we fortunately had a bit of the research already and we just had to sweep through it and go, right, what stuff are you doing at home? What stuff can't you do anymore? And completely on Ashlyn's point, what stuff is easily accessible? If, you know, if I've got one pack of Oreo in the house, every task that we, that we set must be achievable with one pack of Oreo versus, oh, you need 25 packs and you need to build a massive tower like the Game of Thrones thing. Um, you just, that's just not achievable for people and it needs to be an easy thing to escape to, whether you're um, making a plant pot out of a mug or making a brownie or making a real life face filter, all of it was rooted in accessible playfulness um, which didn't, without becoming across as condescending or puerile. That's really. And I think, yeah, we always just put our own, you know, our consumer hat on. We're we were all experiencing it in the same way in the same time that consumers were. And I think if it ever felt like it was being stretched too far, or that we were asking too much of people, and actually, like you say, all of a sudden something really simple like baking some brownies becomes the highlight of a day and becomes the activity that brings a family together. And I think that was the way that we always tried to approach it and think about it was just light relief and genuinely trying to, to help people. I love that you had that insight before as well around busyness, because it definitely feels like a lot of people now is like, you know, we're coming out the other side of lockdown to some degree, don't necessarily want to go back to normal. They've kind of found things um that they that they didn't know that they needed in their lives and it's such an interesting shift but sort of going back to that sort of first stage of lockdown you know we saw a lot of bizarre shopping habits um and you know also a real look for reassurance like a lot of brands have talked about the role of cornerstone brands um, in our lives and um, the kind of comfort factor especially that comes in really highly with biscuits <laughs> And I just really wondered, um, you know, what's your role of, of, and your view of the role of brands in kind of investing in this time? Because it is, it is so easy to press pause or to go, I'm not sure if this is the exact right tone, but I imagine your grocery sales, for example, would be super strong. Like what was the role of marketing at this time? And I think, you know, the, the crunch of 2008, I think, put it all on everybody's radars, the importance of, of investing at a time during a crisis, even when things are uncertain and it's not clear what your return's going to be versus a normal campaign. I think we all know how important it is to sort of stay top of mind and to 
yeah, to be there and to be present and to sort of keep on people's radars. I think that coupled with people were just craving some familiarity and craving something that is going to give a moment of sort of light relief and it be a treat within a safe environment of their home. Oreo is, is having a really good time of it at the moment because of that familiarity and because people are wanting to treat themselves in a way that feels safe. So yeah, I think we knew it was important to do something and to stay on people's radars, but equally doing it in the right way and not just pushing out messages, like I said before, that felt too one way or felt forced or felt like we were trying to profit from an awful situation. Yeah. So, and, and James, what, what's your take on that from, from a strategy perspective in terms of, I, I, kind of, I feel like we're going to come out of this from an industry perspective with a lot of examples of you know, strong brands that have invested through and once again kind of proving that power of investment. Yeah. I think from, I mean, in real terms, I guess, practically, one of the things, just to bring it back to the campaign for a second, um, one of the things we recommended doing for this campaign was that we would roll out organic content and we'd do that first before we put out any paid content. Now, I think, Nikki, you and I have known each other long enough to know that I would never, ever endorse putting out just organic content. Um, and we wanted to test the water. Um, you know, nobody sat at home going, I wonder what Oreo thinks about the pandemic. <laughs> and we know that, right? So how do we make sure that we're, we're entering people's lives in a light way that is actually seen as, oh, I can lean on this. I can lean on this. This is going to help me um, and do that in a good way. You know, we didn't want every single thing in the playbook to be about, and now buy an Oreo, and now buy an Oreo. It's, you know, we want to be practically helping people. And so we did a week of organic content first because genuinely didn't want it to blow up, didn't want people to go, oh my God, Oreo being awful. We had confidence in the campaign, of course we did, but at this time when nobody knew anything and arguably still doesn't, um, mm. you know, you've got to test that water. And so practically, brands investing in this time, I think testing the water first with organic and then going, right, this is not going to blow up in our faces, is one of those rare times where that is completely endorsed. Um, and I would recommend it to other campaigns doing similar things around this time. I think that's such a good point and, and so interesting in the context of the pandemic because we had so many communication strategies. You know, I think a hose pipe brand, like literally contacting me, the CEO of a ho like a hose pipe saying, you know, you know, those kind of thoughts and prayers emails. And it's it's very easy to sort of over communicate as well. But um shifting slightly, I'd love to sort of pull it back to your relationship because you guys haven't met in real life. You've, you've gone through this and there is an element of holding your breath. And it was really interesting the way that you used organic search to kind of, and, and organic social to test those waters. But how did you guys navigate this as an agency and brand partnership? I mean, were you on Zoom calls for the whole time? Like, how did you get that right balance and get that relationship right? And be able to be honest with each other as well, because I imagine that sometimes it's quite difficult to say that you've got, if you've got any doubts about anything or you think that things should be done in a different way um, over um, Zoom calls or, or Teams or, or whatever um, tech you were hanging out on. We, well, I would have to, so first of all, it was daily stand-ups. As soon as we hit <laughs> that, the week of March 23rd, it's like we need to talk to each other every day, mm -hmm. sometimes twice a day. Um, and I've, I've said a lot about my team, um, but I think um, classic agency, my client's so lovely, but <laughs> they're lovely. Um, not from ways of working, but actually, Ashton did a fantastic job of lining up um, the approvals on the Mondeley side, because obviously that approval ladder goes quite high up mm. and getting those stars to align is very, very difficult in any point of time, in any year let alone in the midst of a pandemic when everyone's thinking about pulling budget, pulling campaigns, do this. Um, and so for Ashley, again, who is new into the job to get all of the, all the people are lined up and going, right, we need approval by six o'clock. All right, I'll come back to you. And then approval would, would arrive by six o'clock or a piece of feedback would arrive by six o'clock, but that would be the full and final feedback. Mm. Um, and that was, that was really, really empowering. Um, and because again, the, 
And I'm reminded of Brené Brown, like from, from vulnerability comes immense trust. And, you know, the vulnerable moment of, right, this is our work, it's not finished, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, let's go and let's run with it. Um, I think that was a real kind of galvanizing moment for the team. And since then, we've never really looked back. Um, there's just been, we're working on a new campaign now and you know, the process is still there, the trust in the work is still there. Um, and it's, it's, it's relatively unheard of. And we are so grateful to have the relationship that helps help the work at the time and consistently and continually helps the work moving forward. And from a Mondelez perspective, like how did you navigate that internally? Because in terms of kind of sticking to such a tight timeline, you know, you, mm -hmm. how did you get that through and navigate that? And did you make everyone really aware of this kind of window of opportunity or how did you do that? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, you know, Mondelez is a huge business. There's lots of people involved in every decision and before any media investments are made. So there were lots of people for us to speak to. I think everybody knew that we were pressing on and that we were spending money. So I think we recognized that we needed to get it together really quickly and to make sure that everybody was aligned. You know, that was in the middle of discussions of other campaigns being put on hold and assessing the lay of the land. But I think internally everybody knew, you know, Oreo's purpose is around playfulness and helping people and sort of sparking these connections of people in the home. So it felt like the right brand and the only brand really to speak credibly at that time. So I think we knew that budget was protected. We needed to get something live as soon as possible. And we were really empowered as, as a team, you know, between myself and, and James and the rest of the team at Digitas. We were making decisions and we were running quickly and we were aligning as we went, but we were really empowered as well. So yeah, all worked well in the end. <laughs> and looking back on it, I mean, are there ways of working that you're going to take forward? You know, because there's, there's traditionally, right, there's a lot of theatre in the brand agency relationship. There's a lot of you know, especially, you know, when we're face to face, there's a lot going on. It's, it's, it's very produced often, particularly when it comes to the work and showing the work. Um, you know, this has been a very different process. Are there going to be types of, of, of working or learnings that you take out of this campaign that you are going to run with going forward? I hope so, because I think it's just allowed us to be really agile and really open and honest together. I th we did a big wash up at the end of um, at the end of the playbook campaign. And because it was the first time we're working together, you know, really honest feedback. And I think what we both came out of it saying that we loved was that, OK, we're sharing ideas that might not be fully formed. And again, feedback on the spot isn't fully formed, but it helps us just make sure that we're pulling in the right direction. So I'd love to see that continue. And James, what about from your perspective? Are there things that you have taken to the agency? Like you mentioned, obviously, that you talked about this work to the agency as a whole. Have there been things where you've kind of just decided that that way of working could work for other campaigns or anything that you would, would share from that? Um, the, the kind of the wash up slide, the final slide in that, reflect, that reflective deck was basically trust your team, trust your clients, trust the work. Um, and, and it, it sounds, you know, like, oh, it's a truism, you, know, you have to trust the, trust the clients, you always have to do this, you have to trust the team, just to work. But um, to, to go through that moment of, and also bear in mind on that call where we showed that, that work, it wasn't just us, <laughs> the, the other agency partners were on there as well, which for any agency people watching this was like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was working part of another agency, let alone another agency. Um, so, and that's kind of set the tone a little bit. It's not that we no longer present finished work. It's a case of, well, this is as good as it is right now. Do you want to see it now? Um, and, and also, I must say, um, the media agency is Cara. Um, and we have worked brilliantly with them as well off the back of this. It's not just been all about Digitas and Mondelez. It's the way that we've done, shared the vulnerability and the work and the trust with Cara has done exactly the same thing in that relationship. Um, and so as a triumvirate moving forward, we are, you know, asking each other questions every day, we're talking and sharing. Um, and so, yes, there was that moment of intensity that had to be born out of. And it must be, you know, I can't imagine trying to get to that place. You normally get to that place after a few years of working together. Um, and we got there straight away. 
and I'm I'm just really looking forward to what work comes next based upon you know we've got a new starting point which is normally up here but it's here so where can we go and from a personal perspective um, for both of you I'd love to ask like it it's it's such a um, just unprecedented um, experience to go through and to go through virtually as well I mean what's the one thing that you will take out of it in terms of whether it's actually you know I'm gonna we need to speak more like uh, to our agencies we need to build like those one-to-one -one personal relationships I mean what would be your one tip whether it's actually you know um, I, I like to speak on the phone rather than on video or are there any things like that that you've learned about the way that you work um, that you'll take forward? <laughs> well, joking aside, for the first like few weeks, there was such a sort of client agency divide with who had their video on. <laughs> Is that why you're laughing, James? It's <laughs> be comfortable with video and it would always be like you guys are presenting stuff on film and us reacting not on videos actually that was a massive learning because you you connect so much better you see people's reactions you see the white to people's eyes it's important um <laughs> so that's it's, a funny one but um, it's, why, it's why i'm laughing so basically digitas we made the decision really early i think in the by the end of the first week that we would just always have video on uh, no matter what we call um and so, yeah, to Ashley's point, I think it started off with nothing. And then we started making a bit of a joke about it. Um, and then it was like, okay, on Fridays. <laughs> you can get <laughs> yeah, on Fridays. It's like, okay. <laughs> and, and now it's video all the time, which is great. Um, yeah. And I must, I must say, actually, it was very useful um, in our last creative presentation to see, you, to see you laughing along at some of the ideas, which we wouldn't have seen if your video yeah. was... <laughs> I haven't got a poker face. That probably really helped. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing um, the campaign and the journey that you've both been on. And the, the, I, I love the, the honesty of the video, non-video divide. <laughs> um, I think this is just such a lovely example of um, how being vulnerable and not being, sometimes not being perfect is actually um, the way to get the best work out um, really, really quickly. Um, Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, please do share your thoughts using the hashtag CBExplores and we will be back with another brand agency partnership. So thanks again for joining us and have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.